There's this little town in central Germany called Rotensburg. It is a medieval city. It was spared the horrors of World War II when the German general who is protecting it realized the dire state of the war and decided to evacuate against Hitler's orders and not let this ancient city be uh, shelled and destroyed. Uh, we had the pleasure of going there as a family and uh, we did this thing called the Night Watchman's Tour. Uh, check this out. <laughs> My name is George Night Watchman here. And first of all, I want to give you an idea about the duties a night watchman had back in the old days. Their main job was to guard the city at night. They were out in the streets like police, taking care of the city when all the others were sleeping. <coughs> and sure, that was dangerous, because all the good people were at home at <laughs> Those who were still out in the streets were the drunken folks and thieves, maybe even enemies. Enemies. It was an amazing tour. Oh, man. I love that. Um, tour that we went on. It was so fun. That guy, he still does it. He, he's amazing. And his whole breakdown on uh, just <laughs> the Middle Ages in Rotenberg, it was amazing. But one of the cool things about it was that the idea of gatekeepers, <clears throat> watchmen, this was a fortified city. It had large gates, huge gates that were multiple meters thick and um, the doors were heavy and multi-layered. Uh, they had bulwarks around it. It was really kind of cool. But um, gatekeepers is one of these idea, uh, one of these ideas that um, that it's someone who protects access to the inside. It's someone guarding what is precious on the inside. In all you're reading this week, you might find it odd with a passage that we're going to jump into um, and starting with. But there was enough terror, heartbreak, and turmoil in this last week's passage to fill Dateline for a year, I feel like. It's such a series of sad readings, and it was painful. But um, here's, here's what I want to do. In First Chronicles 26, we have a portion that in, of instructions that King David had given to uh, the gatekeepers, the Levites of the Lord's temple. Um, check this out. First Chronicles 26, 12 to 19 says it this way. These divisions of the gatekeepers through their leaders had duties for ministering in the temple of the Lord, just as their relatives had. Lots were cast for each gate according to the families, young and old alike. The lot for the east gate fell to Shemaliah, and the lots were cast for his son, Zechariah, a wise counselor, and the lot for the north gate fell to him. The lot for the south gate fell to Obed-Edom, and the lot for the storehouses fell to his sons. The lot for the west gate um, and the, the Shikalith, I think is how they say it, gate on the upper road fell to Shupam and Hosa. Uh, and Hosa, guard was alongside of guard, so they stood by each other. There were six Levites a day on the east, four on the north, four on the south, and two at a time at the storehouse. As for the court to the west, there were four at the road and two at the court itself. These were the divisions of gatekeepers who were descendants of Korah and Marii. So... What, what we look at and see in, the, in this is David understood that um, though the temple wasn't yet built, David understood that at the tabernacle there needed to be these, these people guarding the gates. Look at this scripture and let it be a backdrop to you today. Let it, let it fall back onto you as kind of the scene behind what we discuss. As we look at the places in life where we, you and I, are called to be the gatekeepers or the night watchmen. After each section, I will ask you just a few questions. And we'll take those questions and apply them immediately to our own lives so that we can see how they uh, apply to them. You don't have to write each one down, but if one stands out to you, jot it down, pull your phone out, and tack it into your notes real quick so that you can look back on it and see what's going on. But I would guess there's at least one God will be using to speak into your heart. Don't ignore it when you hear it. Don't, don't pull back from it when you hear it. Let God uh, deal with it and bring it before God during this next week. So... Here's one thing we know, looking at the readings of last week, we know that King David was the gatekeeper to his own family and household. He was the gatekeeper to those he loved most. And we look at David and 
I don't know about you, but I've always loved King David. He's one of my favorite Bible characters because of who he is, because he's this shepherd boy who, who de defended his sheep against lions and bears. He wrote worship songs to God. He loved the Lord. He trusted God to do the impossible. Um, I love that when he was young and in those developing years, he just like he had his little harp and he would play. I just, I love David. He's always been this kind of magical character to me. Because he was so faithful in these little things. He seemed almost perfect. He was a man after God's own heart. And that's true of his early days as well as his later days. But David, as we saw last week, he fell. He fell into sin and he made terrible mistakes. And the painful story of Uriah and Bathsheba would haunt him. And now we're going to see further pain descend on the family of David. As him being the gatekeeper, we know that David... Um, he forfeited some of his duties as the gatekeeper of his family. In the story of Amnon and Tamar, both David's children born to different wives, um, we see that Amnon sexually assaulted his half-sister Tamar. And all it said in there about King David's response was he was furious. He didn't do anything. It doesn't show anything. His younger son, his other son, actually David's oldest son, Absalom, um, <clears throat> hated Amnon. He cared for his sister. His, it was his sister, Tamar, who he cared for. And then he eventually murdered his half-brother Amnon because David wouldn't handle it. David seems to abdicate his responsibility inside his own family. He doesn't handle the things that matter most. And here's the thing. Absalom, Tamar's older brother, when he finally had his opportunity to take vengeance, he killed him. He killed his half-brother. He murders him, and he did it in a premeditative way. Then he has to flee from his father, David. So David's lost two sons in this, and he has a daughter who's just ruined by the horrible assault that was done to her. So it's such a sad story. Then Joab puts together a ruse to get David to um, reconcile with Absalom. It's this kind of thing he wants to do to entrap Absalom. And Absalom figures it out and sets fire to all of Joab's fields. And it's not like there's a Walmart in ancient Judea, right? With a kosher section. That's not how it went. That was their food for the next year. So when he burned it down, he did great damage to him. He did great damage to him. So David fails here. He fails in spectacular um, personal ways as a dad, as a mentor, as a leader he, in his own home. I mean, this is the guy who fought off lions and bears. He was the giant slayer. He was the one who was faithful to God all through the hunting of Saul on his own life. Then he was the one who really united the kingdom under him, expanded its borders, and did all these things, but he wouldn't discipline his own kids. He didn't discipline his own children. He failed Tamar, he failed Amnon, and he failed Absalom. When we look at that, a scripture like this has to, a story like this has to sit in our lives. It's in the word of God. And what we have to do is let this scripture shine a light inside of us. Because it's a gift from God, we need to invite the spirit of God to speak to us through this story and ask ourselves, okay, well, here's our first question. Let me just read it to you. Have I left, have I let my own sin past or present keep me from being a gatekeeper in my family? Have you let your past or present sins prevent you from being a gatekeeper in your family? Have you not disciplined your children when they needed it because it's an issue you've dealt with or are dealing with right now? Have you let your own sin, past or present, keep you from being a gatekeeper within your own family? If it is um, something going on in you that you've had, uh, a sin issue that's preventing it, if it's in the past, let it go. You're forgiven. If you've confessed and repented of it, let it go. You are forgiven. And don't parent or lead or keep the gate at your family um, based on what you did that is under the blood of Jesus. Lead well in that, and don't let the voice of the enemy do that. If it's a present sin, remember last week's teaching, confess it, agree with God, repent of it, receive forgiveness from God, and be transformed. 
Don't let Satan put you on the bench in your own home and keep you from parenting, leading, or husbanding, wifing, whatever it is, being a voice of influence, a gatekeeper, someone who keeps safe that which is most valuable. Don't let Satan bench you in your own life because Jesus died so that you could live in redeemed freedom according to his will and purposes, not according to the shame of your sins. So answer that question if it's one for you. But David, let's talk about him again in terms of his role as gatekeeper for the kingdom of Israel. In this week's marathon reading, you would have also come upon an interesting story that involved David and his census. Why would this be an issue, right? It, when, when you read the story of David and his census, aren't you like, what, what's the big deal? He's just counting people. It doesn't seem like, like it, it's that big of a deal. But here's what we know. In the text, it says that Satan incited David to take a census of his kingdom. David was counting what was under him. David probably was taking uh, in, in doing this, not only did he displease God, what he was doing was showing that he trusted more in the armies he led, the people who were under him. And I think it might have been a little of a puffed out chest moment for David where he's looking and, and kind of observing all that's under him and taking security and stock in that. Rather than trusting in God the way he had as a young man, fleeing from Saul, defending the sheep, uh, fighting the giant, what David did in this, he was trusting in the strength of his armies and his chariots, and it displeased God. God looked and said, that's not how we've done this, David. You know me. I'm faithful. I'm good to you and to Israel. Don't trust in your armies. Trust in me. And as a punishment for David's doing this, when he takes the census, God gives him three options. The first one was this, three years of famine. The second one was um, three months of war. The third one was three days of the sword of the Lord. What that means is three days where God would come in and punish Israel with the sword of heaven and, and destroy people there. David chose the last one. David chose the last one. And what's so brutal in this is David, when seeing the hand of God heavy on the people of God, he comes out and he literally, he literally begs to have the punishment fall on himself and not the people because it was him who incited God. It was him, it was David who had done wrong in this and God relents we can read this account and let scripture shine a light on us, shine a light in our own hearts and ask ourselves this question. Have I trusted in my own power rather than God's when it comes to my role as a gatekeeper at work, at home, or elsewhere? This is really tough. This is a tough one for me. Because you want to trust in, your, in what you build up around you, right? And God does not want it. God wants our trust and fidelity to him and him alone. So looking at this, that question should echo. I don't know what your trust is in. I'm not sure where it is. If it's in numbers in the bank, if it's in possessions, if it's in what people say about you, if it's in the gathering group of people around you, the influencers and friends you have. Here's the thing. Have you trusted in your own power rather than God's when it comes to being a gatekeeper at work, in your home, or elsewhere? Have you done that? If that echoes in you right now, write it down and deal with it this week. Write it down and deal with it. The third role, David's um, role as a gatekeeper to the temple. David is admirable for his work on the temple for a couple of different reasons. The first one is this, he worked at the plans for the temple with all his heart. He made such an effort on this. David loved the tabernacle, the house of the Lord, and he wanted to build the temple, a permanent structure, not a tent, a permanent structure for the Lord. He was meticulous in the planning, and he made sure every role, as we read in the beginning, was filled. 
Every corner was watched. Everything was protected and cared for. And, the, and he put the right people in the right places and let those around him live up and into their gifts. He knew he couldn't be on every corner of the wall, so he put people there. He let other people rise to the occasion. He empowered and sent them out. It was awesome. Second, he found out he wasn't the one to get to build the temple. He had shed blood. And God said, your son Solomon will build my temple. And here's the thing, he submitted. He submitted and he gave his all to the part of the project that he had. He gave everything he could to the design and the, and the layout for the temple. But in the end, he submitted to God's best in the actual building of it. And knowing that, that the temple was David's dream. It was something he wanted so badly to do. And God said, no, but your son will. And David submitted. He would not build it. He didn't do that. And that was okay with David because the goal was the glory of God, not the glory of David. It was the glory of God. And God would give that honor to Solomon to do. And we can read this account and we can do the same thing we've done with the others. We can let scripture shine a light in our hearts and ask ourselves this question. Do I let those around me live into their gifts and callings? Do you let the people around you live into their gifts or calling? Do I work at the task that God has given me with all my heart? Do I give everything to what God has called me to do? Am I like David? Am I meticulous and passionate and engaged? And then when the passion burns out, do I, do I obey? Do I give my all to the calling God's given to me? And question number five, the final kind of question in here. Do I submit to the role that the Lord chooses for me? That's one of the hardest ones, is submitting to the role God chooses. Even if it means someone else gets to do what I wanted to do, or gets to do what is my dream and what would be my life goal. Do I submit to that? Do I submit to the Lord, not trusting his wisdom, not in my own? There's a good um, example of this. In the New Testament, we have Paul, the Apostle Paul, and there's another, um, he's not an apostle, but he was one of, the, one of the kind of first generations of Christians. His name was Apollos, and apparently he was incredibly intelligent. Some people think he wrote the book of Hebrews, but there's debate on that, and, um, and I'm not gonna nerd out on it, but it was just kind of this dynamic of people who, um, who would, People follow Paul and Apollos. I think they were both very compelling teachers. I think they both understood the Hebrew scriptures at a rich and deep level and saw the fulfillment of God's word in the Old Testament in the person of Jesus Christ, and they declared it. And there are people who are like, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, and there was a rivalry between them. But here's the thing that we look at. Paul didn't care who you were following. Paul cared only of the glory of Jesus Christ. His only care and concern was that not that people followed Paul or Apollos, it was that people knew the Lord Jesus Christ. That yes, you may have been baptized by Paul or Apollos, but you were baptized into the death of Christ and raised into his new life. That's what Paul and Apollos knew. And I think it's important that we understand in our day and age, there will be things where these last three questions are, are things we have to take account for. Letting people live into our calling, working our tail off, at the thing God called us to do, and finally, submitting ourselves to what God says is best, even when it's hard for us to let a dream go. We have to do these things. So finally, we need to look at David as a gatekeeper, the abdication. We can't ignore that though David had great gifts and was an amazing king, a man after God's own heart, that in many ways he, um, and his accomplishments, I just think to myself, like Israel was a Bronze Age su uh, subdued power in that region when David came to the throne. And by time David leaves the throne, they are an Iron Age powerhouse. He's done so much. His accomplishments are, are literally too numerous to list. And he used, God used David to do so much but in his home, he abdicated his role as a gatekeeper. Having celebrated Father's Day this past week, I think um, 
and looking at baptism today, where we all stand up and we say, yes, we will train these children up in the way they should go. We will teach them truth. We will not bend to culture. We will stand with an understanding of the truth of God in Scripture. And we must take a hard look at ourselves and reckon with the fact that we are called to be gatekeepers We are called to be gatekeepers, people who stand out on the perimeter of things and keep watch over what God loves most. And we gotta guard what we let into our homes, into our hearts, into our eyes, into our lives. We've got to guard them. The second place is, so we guard ourselves, but the second place is our family. Our families need us to stand sentinel. Can I just keep hounding on this? Parents, parent your children. Give them rules. If your kids are constantly happy with you, you're not doing it right. They shouldn't think you're great all the time. They should think like, oh, why, do you, why are you so worried about me? Why do you give me these rules? Why? It makes no sense. It's not supposed to make sense to them. But we as the parents understand there are certain things going on in culture that are deadly, not just to their physical life, but to their spiritual life in Christ. We need to wake up. Your role as a gatekeeper in your personal life, in your spiritual life, and in your family life is vital. Grandparents, aunts, uncles, everybody, you need to be people who stand sentinel. We need to wake up. Culture is screaming into the ears of our family in different things. It's time for the church to no longer abdicate its role in this culture, in our families, in this place. We need to stand up and remember that good people who fail to act are remembered for that failure. Even great King David abdicated responsibility in the most horrible ways. And he's an amazing man. He's a pillar He's a pillar. He's he's the line of Christ. It starts with David. It's amazing, but the fact of the matter is, in his abdication, there was heartache and loss. Friends, it'll be no different for us. My challenge to you is very direct and very clear. Wake up. That culture is saying things about our families, about our identities, about all these things that are alive from the pit of hell, and it is ours to stand sentinel and gatekeeper over the lives of our family and over the lives of of our own, and stand there and say, no, I know who I am in Christ. I'm going to echo back to Dan's message. Our identity in God compels us to stand and know the truth and act upon it. How do you live with a truth like this? It will be disruptive, but it will be for your benefit and blessing if you do. I don't know what question stands out to you, but if you wrestle through one and you want to share with us kind of what you went through, we'd love to. Info, foundrychurch.net. We would love to hear back from you on what God spoke to you in this and these questions and how it's applying to your life and what God's challenging you in because I know this, the life of the believer is always called further up and further in to the life of Christ. And the further in you go to the life of Christ, the more separate you'll feel from this world itself. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we just love you and thank you for who you are. We thank you that we can, um, we can just be here today to listen and hold close this story of someone we love, but someone in King David who had failed And we know that he was still a man after your own heart, that he would confess and repent. So today, God, whatever needs to happen in us, I pray that it would happen. That we would respond faithfully to the questions that that bore a hole in us and that we feel conviction and a need to transform in. Lord Jesus, may your word be a living, active tool in our lives to change us into the image of the one whom we love and confess. It is you, our Lord Jesus Christ. In your name we pray, amen.